before has the reality of the ultimate sacrifice. It's so close to home. At our house, he is the known. Sometimes you just gotta use the right thing. Hey, it's that Voice Over Podcast. I'm Stephen Cox. And this week we talked to Rose Abdu. She's a character actor who you've seen in a million things, uh, but she's also extremely well-rounded, and she's done a bunch of voiceover work as well, uh, most recently doing voices for the film Hotel Transylvania. But there's another reason why we're talking to Rose, and that's because she just finished the most recent season of Parenthood on NBC playing the character of Gwen. Now, if you haven't watched the season yet, I'm just going to give you fair warning. This is a spoiler alert. But Gwen is the cancer patient who mentors Christina when Christina gets diagnosed with cancer. And the character that Rose plays winds up being an emotional anchor for the entire season of the show. But what almost nobody knows is that Rose herself had been diagnosed and battled cancer herself just a year before being cast as Gwen. It's an incredible and really inspiring story, and Rose is just really great and funny in the way she tells it. So I just really wanted to share it with you all, and I I think you'll really, really enjoy it. Uh, It's in the second half of the interview, but first we started by talking about how she got her start in voiceover. I was working at Second City in Chicago, and I, the people in the cast were all getting agents, and I said, uh, I think one of the guys that came that first started me doing it was Joby Cerny, and Joby Cerny was the voice of the Pillsbury Doughboy. He was a big fan of Second City, and I just was so fascinated that standing in front of me was this man that giggled, that whose giggle I knew so well. You know, I was just, I loved that character, and I thought it's the first time it occurred to me that there were people behind these like sort of beloved commercials because I've always been such a huge commercial fan. And he came to Second City show. I was like, I'd love to have you in to audition. So I started going there, and it was Joby Cerny. David Lewis was another casting director that was like a Second City fan, and I think it was through my stage work that people kind of thought I had a distinct voice. So I started auditioning for commercials in Chicago, and I just loved it. I just thought it was like so fantastic to create a whole character with your voice of, you know, the limitations weren't there of like, well, she doesn't look believably, you know, a 50-year-old lady who would own a pizza place, but it was like, it didn't matter what you looked like. And that was just so freeing and awesome to me that I just started doing it in Chicago. Pretty much that's how I made my living. And then when I came out here, I got to meet Eric Seastrand when he was with ICM. And then when he moved over to William Morris, I, I went with him and, just thought that was just like the greatest group of people because they were so just so into doing different voices and also becoming known for your own distinct voice. You just did some work on the film uh, Hotel Transylvania, yes? Yes, and that was the best job because in 1988, the Saturday Night Live writers were on strike and they were in Chicago and I had just finished Second City classes and I was getting ready to audition for a touring company and I heard that these guys needed a girl for their comedy group, but I didn't know who they were. And then I got in and I thought, oh, that's nice. They're fun. This will be a fun little show. And they decided to call it Happy, Happy, Good Show. And I thought, what a stupid name for a show. And the guys were Robert Smigel, Conan O'Brien, and Bob Odenkirk. That's an, and, an incredible group of people. They were. And they were. It was 1988. It was the summer. They were on strike. And they were using the scenes that NBC hadn't approved to put on the air. And I remember the first scene we did was um, Bob Odenkirk coming in. It, my first line was, hey, who's the new guy with the penis? And we were all holding like sort of beach apparatus, you know, rafts and life rafts and uh, umbrellas over our private parts, but it looked like we were naked. And that scene ended up on the next season with Matthew Broderick in the Bob Odenkirk role. But through doing that, I got to know Robert Smigel and I did a bunch of scenes and a bunch of voices for him. And that was 1988. Right. What else did you do with Smigel? I mean, for people who don't know, uh, Robert Smigel is the creator of uh, Triumph, the Insult Comic Dog, the TV Funhouse Animation. And he was the head writer on SNL right. and he was just, just a great guy. And in the 80s, it was like a sketch show, Happy, Happy, Good Show, with like things like the Kennedy baby with Conan O'Brien in a diaper being an angry baby. Like it, it was just such a weird, weird show. And he played a character named Sharp Head. And I, I played um, a Denise Travance character called Vitamin vitamin lady and I just did a bunch of different voices like Alice Cramden I did my Alice Cramden impression and can and we have a little of that sure um, we had uh, well the famous line is like when Ralph goes and gets uh, Norton gets fired and Ralph says he's going to go down I'm gonna, can you do Ralph I'm going to go down to that sewer tomorrow morning and get Norton his job back can you do that? Ralph uh, he was uh, he was Jackie Gleason yeah, okay yeah, yeah. Um, I know you can do um, uh, I'll try um, 
I'm going to go down to that sewer and get Norton his job back. You're not going down to that sewer tomorrow morning, Ralph. There isn't a manhole in New York you could fit through. <laughs> So he was just like a fan, a nice, sweet guy. And we come across each other like there was a sketch show for Dana Carvey and Louis C.K. and Robert were working on it. And they brought me into audition. So I would see him periodically. But, you know, and then I had to do the gong, the updated gong show. And he was there as a judge. But we never really worked together again. Then right before the summer, last summer, he called me and said, I would love you to come and do some voices in Hotel Transylvania. And I was like, I'd love to. So he directed me on Skype. The director was there, of course. And and he and he worked with me, and I thought, oh, I'll just be doing crowd noises. And, you know, I just thought it was one of those looping sessions where you play a crowd. It was four characters. I was so thrilled. It was a, I'm a witch, a little monster, one of the six-headed monsters, and a party guest. Well, that's, that's a lot of stuff. That sounds like big fun. Really, really fun experience. And this, I don't want to get the director's pronunciation of his name wrong. It's G-E-N-N-D-Y. Genji? Gen Gendi? Tarkovsky? He is this incredible, incredible director that let me do um, A Witch. They made a little movie called Goodnight, Mr. Foot that comes on. I think it's going to be like the Easter egg on the DVD, or it was a little short that showed before Hotel Transylvania in the movie theater. And it's just a witch and Bigfoot. And I got to expand my character voice from Hotel Transylvania to do the voice of the little witch in this short. Yeah, it's, it's always great when a director will just let you play like that. You yeah. just be like, and, what do you got? Yeah, and his direction was so incredible because it's like we, someone's directing you exactly what they want of like the witch pulls her hat over her whole body and then gets, you know, slams the window on her nose. And it was just, he works in such a specific way that it was really, really fun to, to bring that little drawing to life. I, I would like to do more of that. So I do want to shift gears and talk about the role that you recently played on the show Parenthood, the yes. uh, the role of Gwen Chambers, who's the cancer patient who ends up counseling the character of Christina, played by Monica Potter, through her cancer diagnosis. But what most people don't know is that you yourself had your own battle with cancer. Was it a, a year before you landed the role? It was. It was. I remember Cami Patton's office called me in to audition for Parenthood August 1st. And I walked in that day and I had read the sides and I said, I have to first tell you that whoever wrote this really understands what it's like to just the lines were just so chillingly real. And I said, it's a year to the day that I finished the chemo. August 1st was my last day of chemo. The following August 1st was the audition for the, this character that was saying, here's how it's all going to go down. Your husband's going to want to tell you to stay off the internet. You're going to, everyone who you ever met is going to call you and offer sympathy. And then after a while, it's going to taper off. I mean, the lines were so everything I'd said in real life. I kind of couldn't believe it. And I felt like I have to tell her that this is, this was my And And, and what story. was her response when you, when you did tell her? She just she just looked at me kind of incredulous and she did share it with the director and he, Sam Yeager, who was actually in the show also. And he happened to be directing that episode. I don't know if that's the thing that put me over the top to get the part, but I certainly commend them for getting someone who really had the realistic experience of it. And they're just like an incredible, incredible group of people. Yeah, and I know. It, people, did, did the writers ever ask you about your own experiences at, at any point? No, they, they didn't. didn't. They didn't really, but they were very, very open to me saying, I mean, in the, in the first episode I did, we had that scene in the coffee shop. It's so interesting because the very first, you know how you shoot everything out of order. So the first thing we shot was she and I in the coffee shop. But when I really met her character, when Gwen Chambers meets Christina, it was in the little hospital waiting room. And I said to them, I had my own Gwen Chambers. I mean, I remember sitting, going to the chemo, um, the first day going to my oncologist and there was a woman who was just had gone through it all. And it's just, it was so irritating because at that point you don't know what you're in store for. And she's like, oh, you're going to be doing chemo. What do you want? And, what, and I said, I haven't even started yet. And I didn't even know if I was going to need it. And it was just horrible. So I knew that she was so well intentioned, but so annoying. So I knew, I just knew how to play it. And little did I know a year later that that annoying woman in my own oncologist's office waiting room would be a gift to me because I wouldn't have understood. I would have just thought, just seen it as very black and white, you know, instead of seeing all the shades of this person's scared. I know they're scared. I want to help them. I've already gone through it. I can't help but share my knowledge. I'm so happy that I'm almost over with this. So I put all that, I tried to put all of that together to be Gwen Chambers. 
and I'm so glad she gets the scene in the coffee shop where she gets to tell her and be more sympathetic and understanding, but also say yes, your oncologist is you don't need a friend, you need a doctor because you you're very sensitive when you're going through it, and, and at least I was, and you you do want the doctor to be extra compassionate and almost like your pal. My doctor did sort of turn into my pal. He just called me this morning, and I really feel like um, I just had that extra level, and they were very very respectful of that, and and. Sam really listened to me, and they want you to improvise, but I have to tell you, it was written so beautifully, I really didn't improvise that much, the, the monologue in the, uh, in the coffee shop, and then I was very happy when they brought me back. What they really listened to me was, they, I said that the, the um, chemo room, they wanted Christina to run into me in the doorway of this last episode. That's how it was written, and I said she would see her in the chair. It just would have more impact if she was sitting down. Th- that was your was, suggestion oh, to be my in suggestion the chair. Was that, well, I, I feel like I should kind of set this up for listeners who maybe didn't see the yeah. the season or the episode, but your character is kind of the bookend for the entire season. Yeah. It, it begins with Christina's cancer diagnosis, and you're there as a, a fellow cancer patient, and you befriend her, and you tell her what might be coming. And one of the things that you do is you convince her to go with a doctor who isn't all that sensitive, uh, and you do that because you your character knows that he's the better cancer doctor. That's right. And then at the very end, it comes full circle, and this is a, a spoiler again for anyone who has not seen the season finale, but Christina has gotten a relatively clean bill of health from her doctor, and then on her way out, she sees you, your character, Gwen Chambers, who has relapsed. Correct. And then I'm in in the chair, and I and I said it was your suggestion to be in the chair. My suggestion to be in the chair, and I also said they set they did the master shot of the chair reclined. Well, when they set the lights to shoot the close ups, the chair was in an upright position, and when I got to the chair you know how they say second team and you get back in i recline the chair and the camera guys are like no 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 rose don't because we've already hung the lights this way the direct she, he came over to me and said rose i want you to you know tell me if you need anything else like there were just those kind of kind people that were really like we want you to be happy with your take like they're just wonderful to work with like peter krause and monica potter are very um they're just great improvisers they 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 you know take what's written on the page but they also kind of like go off the page and really make it so special because it's like they just know how to, you know, relate to each other as their characters. And it's just, it's, I was really excited to see that. Them well, being so did so you improvise a lot of the scenes? Did you get to improvise some? Cause I know that parenthood is improvised somewhat, which yeah. gives it kind of a natural and, and very true to life. Feel. We did. We did the coffee shop scene between Monica and I, we, we really got to know each other and improvised and, and, Lawrence Larry Trilling was the director of the um, the second one. Sam Yeager did the first the first episode that I did, and then Larry Trilling did the second one. And and I said to him, the chair has to be reclined. This is chemo. And I said to him, this is not chemo. <laughs> Sitting upright in the chair. But I have to tell you, it, it was so challenging. It was it was wonderful to do that scene with her in the coffee shop, telling her what she was in store for. But it really and I thought, okay, it's been a year, but it was so still so close. Yeah, yeah, I, and I wanted to ask about that. I mean, were there any points where it was just like, this is too overwhelming, I can't do this? Yes, it was. I, it's interesting you say this, and I do think this, talking to you about it, is another kind of catharsis that was like destined for me also, because today is February 1st, and I have heard from all of my support group friends that if you live through the day of your diagnosis, you're considered a survivor, and the day of your diagnosis is considered your cancer birthday. And I used to see that commercial with Ricky Martin and be like, what? Cancer birthdays? Like I just didn't, it was a whole world that I didn't even know or understand. And today, February 1st is my cancer birthday. Oh, congratulations. So, and, and this is two you. years, it's right? Two years. Yeah. And I have to say that walking into the chemo room, cause that was just last month, January 3rd or whatever, it's 8th that I did that scene. It was like, you know, when you have a grocery cart and you're in the parking lot and there's that painted line and the grocery cart won't go over the line. Yeah. You know, when it's stuck like that, I, I walked in, it was an abandoned hospital. I mean, a, you know, a hospital that's just used for filming in Beverly Hills. And I walked in the room and as soon as I saw the chemo chairs and the poles, I stopped like the way a cart gets stuck in the doorway. And I just involuntarily burst into tears. And it was just seeing the chairs and the poles and the, just crazy. And then the woman playing the nurse was a real nurse in real life, which I thought was nice that they got people that really knew how to run that equipment. And she said to me, just to poke, when she started to attach the fake IV to my arm, and I looked at her like, yeah. And she goes, oh, no, I'm sorry, did I scare you? And I said, no, no, no. So she taped the thing on my arm, and I just had this horrible flashback to my stupid pick line. 
then it was, it was so ingrained in me that when I got up to go to the bathroom, I started to take the pole with me and I couldn't stop laughing. And she's like, Oh no, Rose, I can unattach it. And I went, no, you have to take the pole to the bathroom. She goes, no, you don't. And I was like, wait a minute. Like it just, it put me right back in the chair. Well, um, I wanted to ask if you knew if there were other cancer survivors who were part of the extras in the the scenes there or even cancer patients. You know, not that I knew of. I know there's there were extras that really looked authentic, but my to my understanding they were just people who either, you know, had shaved their heads or that they I I to my knowledge they weren't actual cancer patients, but they really did look authentic. And they may, they may, they might have been, I mean, maybe someone just told me that cause they didn't want me to get to have too many flashbacks or whatever, but they're the, just the kindest people. It's just a very kind crew and they all like get along with each other and they're just so supportive. And I, it was fascinating to watch because it was also like such a well-oiled machine. I mean, that's a show that's in its, what, this was the fourth season and really, really nice and a massive, massive crew. I mean, I've done a lot of episodic TV, but this was in my memory, the biggest crew, I, I feel like there were like 11 people on the camera crew alone and they shoot, you know, all three cameras running at the same time. It was just an amazing and very quick. They work very quickly. Right. And that's one of the differences between doing a show that is single camera and you know, like a three camera show uh, like this. Um, the way that Parenthood is shot, I understand, is that there are just camera people everywhere. And so mm-hmm. they try to catch the live action. There are people at camera people at like every different angle angles and different angles and they do it. So you barely know what's happening. Like in that, we shot that um, coffee shop scene in a restaurant called Republic of pies in North Hollywood. And the cameras, I feel like one guy's behind a plant. The other one's over by the coffee bar. So as an actor, it's fantastic because you just really can concentrate on the scene without going, Oh, the mat box is right next to my teeth. You know? So they're really inconspicuous. They stay out of the way. I really felt like they were. And even in the chemo room, I felt like they were just kind of buried in the corner and you, and you're, it's fascinating how, how they can pick you up because in the coffee shop too, they were just sort of, um, yeah, behind the counter. And you, you, I felt like as an actor, you're really not aware of them. It's, it's kind of a great way to work. And I really connected with Monica and it's another crazy weird timing thing that happened is when we shot the scene where she gives me, I thought that was so moving and such good writing that the the mother-in-law, the Bonnie Bedelia character gives her that sort of cozy shirt that several different women had worn. Right. Yeah. That was a, that was a big part of the whole story was the passing down of this shirt. Your character, Gwen gives the shirt to Christina at the very beginning. And then it comes back around at the end. Well, she, the mother-in-law gives it to her. And I remember putting it on pause and looking at that. And I said, this is such good writing because it shows in an instant, how many people will be touched by this Mm. happening to them. And, and how many have and how they've lived to tell the tale and they can survive. And then when she gave, I didn't know the script. I hadn't seen it when I, when I was so moved by the fact that she gets that blanket. And then when she gives it to me, at the end, it was like so emotional. And that was the night before my um, PET CT scan, my, my sixth one. I mean, and what was going through your mind when you were shooting and waiting for the well, results? Well, I looked at her and Monica looked at me and she goes, I can't look at you without tearing up and I said I feel the same way and and then I just whispered to her when she hugged me I thought we turn into Christina and Gwen Chambers in real life I'm gonna be really mad she's like it just can't it was so weird and she just texted me throughout to while I was waiting for my results and I just thought this would be just too weird if I did this a year after I'd gone through this and that the night before my pet CT scan if I was my my experience dovetailed Gwen Chambers that would just be crazy it almost relaxed me because I knew the universe it just would be too weird if that was my real story in real life, too. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, and that makes me want to ask, like, I know that you worked during the time that you had the cancer diagnosis and you were battling it. I did, yeah. I did, and I have to tell you, I shot The Guilt Trip, the Barbara Streisand movie. I got the good fortune of, you know, getting to play one of her friends in the movie, and the scene is very short when you see it in the actual movie, but it was seven and a half hours of shooting, and Ann Fletcher's a great, really fun director, and she really let us improvise, too. And But that was between chemo four and five. Mm. What was it like seeing yourself really hard. going through all that in the past? It was hard. And I have to say, when I went to loop it, I didn't realize how sick it was going to make me because just seeing, seeing my face on screen brought back the whole, oh yeah, I was taking chemo pills and antibiotics and I had just finished the infusion and we were eating roast chicken over and over and over again. And I really, it was just really hard not to throw up on the table. So you're thinking, oh, I have this idol 
I love Funny Girl and Funny Lady so much as a child and just everything Barbara Streisand ever did. And I'm, she's to my right, and I'm thinking, I, you can't throw up in front of Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Hold it together. So, but I think going through things like that makes you feel like, ah, you really can't do anything if you put your mind to it. You really have to. It's, it's just such a lesson in such extreme focus and concentration because it's, it's, it was right when in the middle of it all. And I was, I was very sick when I look back on it. I think... You know when they tell the stories of the mother that lifts the car off the little kid because their adrenaline's look flowing? Yeah. There's really something to that because it was just so exciting to be there and be on a set with Barbara Streisand, oh my God, that I kind of put the whole nausea aside, but I was really sick. And so when I see it, now when I see it, I can't even look at my face because I feel like I look horrible in that movie. Mm. The whole thing has been about a two-year ordeal, and I'm wondering if doing the part on parenthood gave you any kind of sense of closure with all of it i think i really think it did i think it put a button on i mean even though my character doesn't doesn't have the best right yeah and i think we're to assume that the character of gwen doesn't make it well my my, i said to the director can next season when can she come back and we can see gwen chambers with her hair and she's better and everything. And he, and he just kind of smiled. And I mean, I don't know what the fate of the show is. I certainly hope it returns for a fifth season and I would love to be back on it. But, but I do think that because it's TV, that's the best way to get the point across about the character of Christina being so grateful that she's fine is that usually the main character suffers a a loss like that. I mean, you've seen that in, in television that has a lot of impact when they sort of are like, phew, I skated by without having that happen, but this happened to, you know, so it's, it just keeps it in your mind of how grateful you can remain. But I, I have to say it was just, I, I had joined a cancer support group and, and it was just kind of like, it was an honor to get to do it. And I know that sounds a little cheesy or whatever, but it's really like, I have, you know, I know people that are going through that right now. And it's just, you, you need that kind of support and you need that kind of catharsis of watching someone on TV do it. I think it helps people like certainly men access their emotions that show does, you know, there's a lot of crying on parenthood. But well, yeah. Yeah. And I can like, tell you from my own experience that Lori and I pretty much spent the entire second half of the show, the season yeah. finale, um, just crying. Just with a big box of Kleenex. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you have done one woman shows in the past. Uh, one was called, who does she think she is? And I think the other yeah, one was uh, get to the part about me. And it might be too early to ask even, but do you think that there is a, a one woman show in the experiences that you've had? I do. I do. And I think I did. My last show was called um, um, Rose Abdu in Rose Ab Don't because I have uh, had a lot of um, interesting experiences having an Arabic last name, especially like traveling and after 9-11. And my show was kind of about just being on television and growing up, you know, Dominican, Lebanese and after I did it, the last version of it, a lot of people were like, this show, I think it was like 45 minutes. That's what you get the time allotted to do it in that Comedy Central space where I did it. And they said, you should add like 20 minutes to it. And I remember thinking, well, what am I going to do for 20 minutes? What else, what else do I have to really talk about? And then this happened. I mean, it happened right after I thought that. I was getting ready to do the show again in January. And that January 28th, I had an operation for what was supposed to be a routine appendectomy. And they found a tumor on my appendix, an appendix cancer is considered, you know, the mortality rate's 100%. Like, there's no way to find it. You can't find it in a colonoscopy, even though it had invaded my colon and was classified as a colon cancer. You can't find it. So I kept saying to seven different doctors, I feel like there's something wrong. I feel like there's something growing. I feel like there... And if I can tell one person about it, if you have a stomachache that seems strange in any way, I'm not saying to people be a hypochondriac, but I knew for years there was something wrong with me. Ultrasound, ultrasound. Uh, they couldn't find anything. So this odyssey of going through it, finding a tumor that was growing the size of it, they told me I had it for like five years. And I do think that there's my extra 20 minutes that I could add to the show. And ending with my experience of actually having to play a cancer patient on a television show. I, I think I think it was like I, I wished for it. And <laughs> it came, and you you got to be true. careful what you wish for. You really do. And I think that I could never have played that character with the the knowledge, you know, I just couldn't have done it before the same way. And my sister said, I'm, I'm glad you are so, uh, you do your research so thoroughly for acting. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really have to go that far? 
you know, right. but I did. It's so funny because I had taken pictures. I went to the Disney Cancer Center was where I took my chemo treatment and I posted a picture of me in front of the big sign, the Roy and Patricia Disney Cancer Center and people from high school, of course, you know, in this day of Facebook, everyone knows what you're doing all the time. And they saw it and went, Oh, Rose, what, what kind of show are you doing at the, at the Disney Center? And I went, no, no, it's like, unfortunately it's not a show, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it might be, I mean, it might be something might that be. you, uh, that, that you could do for closure. I think I have to. Do you know that the week before I figured out what was wrong with me, I was going by the um, the, the Falcon Theater in Burbank here, and I thought, I wonder if I, if I ever got, I this popped into my head, if I ever had something really big wrong with me like cancer, I wonder if I could write a one-person show about it that would be different than any other one-person show anyone's ever written about. That was actually that I thought of, and that same week I had done an exercise class, and for I don't know why it popped into my head. There were eight women in the front row, and I thought, wow, with the statistics now, probably five people in this front row will have cancer. I don't know why those two things occurred to me the the, the month of my diagnosis. But you really have to be careful about what you think about, Rose. I know. <laughs> or is it something that's going on and I just pick up on it? I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a psychic gypsy, but I might be. You might be. So yeah. Um, yeah. what is next in terms of voiceover, in terms of uh, on camera? Well, I'm hoping that Bunheads... Bunheads, Bunheads right. ABC You're doing Family Bunheads show. on ABC Family with Sutton Foster. ABC right. Family, yeah, with the same creator of the Gilmore Girls, Amy Sherman Palladino, who I just love working with. And she, we finished the 18 episodes of the first season, so I think the hope is that that would get renewed and I would get to play. I'm sort of a town busybody big stretch <laughs> Sam <laughs> and I get to tap dance badly which is so much fun and I hope to do more of those and I don't really have any other plans right now this is sort of a exciting time waiting for, to see what happens I, I was very lucky and I remember sitting in the chemo room and thinking okay things are bad but if you believe the yin yang and you believe the pendulum swings so far this way after the bacterial blood infection and the six rounds of chemo and getting sicker than I ever imagined and having, you know, being hospitalized twice, I thought it's got to get better. And I just remember feeling like this things are going to get so much better. In 2012, I think I had, I don't know, like eight guests, TV guest spots between March and December. So I, I just knew it would get better and it did. And I think that I try and tell people that when you're in the depths of despair, that it's just got to turn around. I mean, it's just got to, you know? Well, I'm just really happy for you, Rose, uh, particularly you. because this is your two-year uh, anniversary of being cancer-free. I believe the doctor on the Parenthood episode says that they don't say cured until five years, but you right. are cancer-free, and that's a big deal. It is a big deal. Thank you for saying that, and I really think that it's very... Um, it was meant to be, and I'm, I'm so flattered that you even wanted to talk to me about it because I, I was very proud of parenthood and it's, it's kind of, it's very gratifying to hear there's fans of it and people, you know, care about what you do. And well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just an amazing story and I just really wanted people to hear it. Thank you. It. Um, I'm wondering like, what have people said? Have you read anything online in particular about your character or the... You know, I wanted to say there are people who write, you know, there's all different types. Before I started, I didn't know there's like 33 types of chemo, if not more. And there were people that wrote, some of my friends directed me towards the Parenthood Facebook page. And I know there was, the fans were very passionate about the show, which it was great to see. And there were people that wrote, you know, oh, that's so typical of Hollywood, putting that lady on with her big, thick eyebrows and her thick eyelashes. Cancer, you know, chemo makes you lose all your hair. And I wanted to write back, excuse me, but I'm a stage 2B survivor as well. And I didn't lose my hair. I mean, and, and, and that was just due to the type of chemo you did? Yeah, my type of chemo is called oxaloplatin and Veloda. It's called Zelox, the treatment. And colon cancer chemo, I think out of like 12 patients, my doctor told me maybe like seven will lose their hair or, or three. Or it's like, it's a lower number than breast cancer patients almost always, always lose their hair. And I said to him, I'm Dominican Lebanese. If there's one thing I know how to do, doctor, it's grow hair. So I just knew I wouldn't. My hair thinned, but I didn't lose it. And I think that people, when they look at you, go, but you don't lose your hair. That's the first thing everybody says when you tell them you had chemo. And there's like a, a weird thing where they look at you like, well, you must not have been that sick because you still had your hair. But it's still, you're every bit as sick, make no mistake, but I did not have to lose my hair. So it's a whole different dimension. I just admired Monica so much for, um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot to go through as a woman from the ladies I've talked to. And you just, it's like your vanity is involved too. Not, not, not only do you feel so sick, you can't cross the room, but you, you don't look the same. And I didn't have to go through that. I looked the same, you know, but, but still like the memory of it. I mean, for instance, I had to get rid of the furniture in my living room because I, every time I looked at this big green chair, I'd be like, 
just think about the days and days and days where you weren't able to get up and move around. Right, and you just um, you just spent way too much time yeah. in that chair. Yeah, but then I would I would manage to work. My friend Ronnie gave me a great compliment. Ron Zay, an old friend of mine who actually produced my show, and he said, "You didn't stop your life for cancer. You sort of fit the cancer into your life." And I and I worked whenever you know auditions would come up. If I was well enough to go, I'd go. The you know the Barbara Streisand guilt trip audition was the day after my first chemo. And like I said, that shooting it was between the fourth and fifth ones. And I did commercials and I, I tried, you know, as much as I could. But I really have to say it, it's, it's, it's something else when you really feel like you're being poisoned slowly. I, it was, it's just, it's a really interesting experience. And, and, and it was cathartic to, to play Gwen and, and have, have that sort of closure and really just sit in that chair. And I said to my oncologist, I played a cancer patient. He goes, did you just keep saying to yourself, this is fake, this is fake, this is fake. I said, yeah, I had to. That whole day I had to. Well, Rose Abdu, I just really want to thank you for coming on the show and, and sharing your amazing story. I just really, really appreciate it. I appreciate you asking me about it because I think it does help to talk about it. And I think people, some people's instinct is to keep everything private. And I respect that. But I have to say, from my experience, it just lightens your load to be able to tell people what you've been through and not pretend that it didn't happen and, and let people know that if it does happen, like, look, if someone's sick and listening to this or or just know that there's life on the other side of it. Cause there are some days where you feel like, wow, this is never going to be, I'm never going to feel good again. And I'm here to tell you, I feel fantastic two years later. Well, that's huge. So congratulations, Rose. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. That voiceover podcast is a co-production of Half Full and Get Creative, Inc. If you would like to read an excerpted article uh, about Rose's story written by my incredibly talented wife, Lori Colwell, uh, head over to her blog, which is funnystrange.net. Thanks.